Hi, my name is Zoe and I'm one of the Applied Law teachers here at HNC. I'm going to be talking to you today about what it's like to study on the Applied Law course and also give you a little bit of a taster as to what it is that we're going to be doing in the sessions. So in terms of what Applied Law is, we offer two courses here, A-Level and Applied. Um, and one of the biggest questions we get asked is what's the difference between the two? In terms of what the structure of the applied course is, is it's a more of a modular style of learning as opposed to the generic traditional A level. What that means is that you're going to have a combination of units and you're going to have a combination of coursework and examinations on those units. There's going to be a build up of your grade, so you're not going to get your grade at the end of two years, you're going to work towards it throughout. In addition to that, the Applied is much more vocational based, which means that we will be preparing you for a career in law as opposed to just trying to test your knowledge. And that means that each assessment will be giving you advice or giving advice to a client um, who has a legal issue and you have to not only explain what the law is, but how it's going to fit them in their scenario. So it's much more about problem solving as opposed to just testing your understanding of the law. In terms of the content that we look at, there is a criminal and taught focus, um, meaning that in both years there will be an assessment on a criminal aspect of the law, so it might be non-fatals, it might be murder. There's also a bit on negligence where we're going to look at careless behaviour, so when a defendant has fallen below a standard of care but they haven't meant to, so they're lacking that criminal intent. You'll be giving advice on whether or not a client can sue for compensation, which is a phrase you've probably heard already. So the final thing is that there is a different style of examination. So it's not like the traditional sitting in an exam hall and answering um, questions. Instead, what you're going to be doing is you're in a smaller environment. It's a word processed exam, meaning that you're going to be doing it on a computer. You're given pre-release information. So you're given information before you step into the exam with a hint as to what the exam is going to be on and you can also take in up to two sides of A4 notes to help you prepare for advising your client. One of the very first things that we take a look at in um, applied law is the people that are heavily involved in the criminal law process. So we look at solicitors and barristers, um, judges, as well as that we take a look at people who don't have any legal experience juries. This is something that you might be quite familiar with as um, lots of people have an involvement in this. You might have family members who have served on a jury panel and you often see these on TV quite a lot. In terms of how you qualify to be a juror, you have to be 18 to 75 in that age category. You have to be a British citizen or have lived in the UK for at least five years. And you also have to be on the electoral register, meaning that you have to have registered to vote, which is something that you can do from the age of 16. There are some things that can make you ineligible for this. So if you have a criminal record, if you um, have, um, if you're serving in prison at the time, or you have been declared mentally incapable of doing so, um, then you will be disqualified from this. In terms of how it is that you're selected, it's through an, a random selection process on the electoral register, meaning that some people can be selected more than once and others may never be selected at all. In terms of what you have to do as a applied law student is you have to explain to a client what it is that a jury does as well as how they can qualify and how they don't qualify. So in terms of whether or not a person can um, refuse jury service, the answer to that is no, and that's because this is a civic duty, something that you have to do. There are occasions in which you can defer jury service if you want, and these are in only in instances where you have a good reason to do so. So it might be that you have booked a holiday, you've got an exam, you're a new parent, or you've got an operation up and coming in the slot that you've been selected to do. There are a few occasions in which you can be excused, which means that you don't have to serve on a jury panel. And that's if you've served on a jury in the last two years. You're a full-time member of the armed forces, a full-time carer, or you are suffering with a serious illness, which means that taking two weeks out of your schedule just isn't possible. 
So in terms of what it is that a jury member actually does um, once they have been selected for jury service um, is that they have to attend a Crown Court somewhere in the UK, it's usually quite close to where you live, and you will be expected to attend for at least two weeks. In that time you're going to be listening to around two to three trials, but again it depends because it is a random selection process once you're in there as well. So you're randomly selected to serve on a um, a panel in a criminal trial and there will be 12 jurors in that space. Um, you don't have any idea as to what the criminal case is going to be on, you don't know who the defendant is until you walk into the room. Once there you'll be told about what it is that you are expected to do whilst sitting on that criminal trial, including listening to evidence that's been presented by the prosecution and the defence. So they will have a range of um, witnesses, a range of statements, maybe videos, maybe physical evidence, and you're expected to listen to the events that have come forward, either the prosecution side, whose job it is to prove guilt, um, and the defence's side, who are going to be providing an argument that's going to hopefully place some doubt in your mind as to whether or not the defendant has committed the crime or not. You're then required to reach a verdict of either guilty or not guilty based on the evidence that you have heard. And if you're going to return a, ver a decision of guilty, um, you have to do so and it has to be beyond reasonable doubt, meaning that there has to be no doubt in your mind that this individual is guilty of the crime that they have been accused of. One of the things we also take a look at is one of the more complex matters of whether or not having a trial by jury is valuable, whether or not it has a benefit or whether or not we need change. So in order to achieve the highest grade in the applied law, which is the distinction, you're going to have to give your client advice as to whether or not they should be in favour of having a trial by jury. So you're talking about the advantages and the disadvantages of a trial by jury. One of the points that we're going to look at, and this can be perceived as either an advantage or a disadvantage, is whether or not juries reach a fair verdict, whether or not they actually listen to the evidence that's been presented to them and reach a just conclusion. This is where you guys come in. What I want you to do is listen to the facts of the case that I'm about to present and I want you to decide whether or not you think the defendant should be found guilty or not guilty. This is a real case, it took place in 1998 and it is the Crown versus Blythe. This is Mr Alan Blythe, who is a 52 year old man who has been accused of a crime and is now sitting in Leeds Crown Court. You have been selected for jury service and you have been given the following information. The defendant has been charged with cultivating cannabis with the intention to supply, probably an offence that you're not familiar with. Essentially it means that he's been charged with growing cannabis in his house with the intention to pass it on to another individual. The maximum time you can spend in prison for this is up to 14 years. It's not necessarily a sentence that you're going to face, but it's the maximum that a judge can allocate if you are found guilty of it. You are to listen to the prosecution's argument and the defendant's argument and decide whether or not someone's guilty or not guilty. So, prosecution always goes first. Prosecution have got quite a simple case. The only real witness that they have coming to the stand is a police officer who searched his house. In that time, the police officer has announced that upon searching the house, he has seized a number of items. Ten cannabis plants, several pots um, and a variety of growing equipment. The prosecution also puts a forward to the case that Mr Blythe accepts he was growing cannabis. He acknowledges that he was growing cannabis in his house. So he's put his hands up and said, yep, yeah, I, I was doing so. Seems quite straightforward at this moment. Then the defence rise and they give their arguments. Now it's their job to place doubt in your mind as to whether or not this person's guilty. Once the prosecution rests, the defence stand forward and they make their argument. And Mr Blythe stands up and says he does accept that he has grown cannabis in his house, however he's using a defence called duress by circumstance. This essentially means that the defendant is arguing that he's committed the crime because he had to, out of a circumstance. He was forced into doing it um, and he wouldn't have done it had this circumstance not, have, um, had not occurred. The reason as to why he was growing cannabis in his house is because his wife was diagnosed recently with multiple sclerosis. This is a terminal illness which causes severe pain and also cuts lives short. 
His wife also took to the stand and said that she had tried all of the medicines that had been prescribed to her and nothing was helping ease the pain. In fact, she actually said in the courtroom, it was so severe that I wanted to die. I wanted someone to kill me. I felt as though I'd been thrown into the bottomless pit at 100 miles an hour and I couldn't even move my eyeballs. Mr Blythe is arguing the only reason as to why he grew um, cannabis in his house is out of fear that his wife was going to take her own life. He wasn't planning on selling it on to any other individual. The intent to supply part was to give it to his wife and that was the only reason um, that he had. Once that's come to an end and both parties have um, rested their case, then the jury are off to deliberate. However, before you go off to deliberate, the judge reminds you that it's your job to find either Mr Blythe guilty or not guilty. And he's acknowledged the defence that's been raised by Mr Blythe. However, he's in this instance saying, this is not a defence that can be used in these circumstances. The law does not recognise duress by circumstance as a defence to cultivating cannabis. So you as the jury, how would you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? Pause the video now, have a think about it. So I'm sure you're all here for the actual verdict. This was the verdict that was reached by the jury in 1998. They found the defendant not guilty of cultivating cannabis with the intention to supply. However, he was convicted of being in possession of it. He couldn't argue the fact that he didn't have it on his person and therefore was fined £100 and he was able to spend the rest of his wife's days with her. We use this case to explain that despite the judge giving clear direction that the defence that Mr Blythe raised wasn't a valid one, that the jury still decided not to convict him and let him go as a free man. Do you think that this was the right decision, bearing in mind that the reason as to why we have juries is for justice and fairness in the criminal justice system. Do you think that this is in favour of that or do you think it goes against it? If you're interested in this case and this subject, I would recommend that you take a look at the following cases, all of which juries have made some quite controversial decisions or used some quite controversial methods to reach these conclusions. So what do you think? Do you think juries came to the right decision? Do you think that, or what do you think can be inferred um, from how reliable juries are in this instance. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you've enjoyed that taster session on applied law and I hope to see you soon.